Hello guys, again this is Professor Brian Ives Araneta. Welcome to Plant Systematics. Actually, this is the subject that is not in the list of my favorites, together with uh, embryology. But uh, of course, I have no choice but to give you an overview to the best of my ability as a biology teacher. Of course, you will be uh, expecting here uh, plant characteristics and how you can make good use of them to uh, make them belong into a particular group. That's why it's, uh, uh, you also need uh, adequate background of plant structure and function as well as genetics and molecular biology. Now, we usually define plants as organisms uh, that can uh, photosynthesize. But again, in this subject, we will go beyond that. Uh, we will look at the evolutionary history of plants and how the uh, relatedness of various plant groups can be useful in defining the plant in general. So if we uh, trace back the evolution of plants, uh, we should start with uh, your single-celled prokaryotes. And uh, due to some kind of, let's say, luck, the uh, chloroplast and the mitochondria evolved. So we now have the eukaryotes. Uh, they started existing and flourishing. So can you still recall the theory? Okay, It's called the endosymbiotic theory where a larger um, prokaryote engulfed a smaller prokaryote and they started some sort of a mutual relationship where the smaller prokaryote evolved into the chloroplast and the mitochondria. Now, there are plenty of assumptions and so-called um, evidences to support this theory. So just Google them. So therefore, uh, plants started as prokaryotes with chlor chloroplasts. So we now we have our blue-green algae. Uh, then uh, they started to form colonies and later invaded land. Perhaps that's their most uh, predictable course. Then we have further evolution to the diverse groups of plants that we know today. Now here... Let's check this cladogram. So what is a cladogram, guys? At this point, um, just think of it as a sort of an evolutionary tree. So the root here is the ancestor. Then we have uh, further branching towards different groups and uh, eventually individual species. Now the lines of the uh, cladogram represent line lineages. And uh, further branching represents uh, lineage divergence. So we have uh, diversification from one common ancestor. And um, also you can see here a plenty of chloroplasts in these groups here, in these plants here. So this denotes uh, plants in these groups. Now a mon monophyletic group or clade is a group uh, uh, consisting of a common ancestor plus uh, all, all the descendants of that common ancestor. Now, there are, maybe you will uh, encounter groupings like a uh, paraphyletic group, group, paraphyletic group, which is uh, one consisting of uh, a common ancestor, but not all the descendants of that common ancestor. You also have your polyphyletic group, which are, uh, which in which there are Two or more separate groups and each with a separate uh, common ancestor but of course uh, obviously they do not portray uh, an accurate picture of an evol evolutionary history uh, as they can of course confuse you so better read the uh, explanations in um, books or texts if you ever encounter these types of groupings now the cladogram can also be uh, used as a tool for addressing uh, several interesting biological questions. For example, uh, the, uh, we may look at the biogeographic or ecological history or processes of speciation and um, other uh, processes in evolution. Right now, let's focus on the green plants. And uh, by the way, I forgot to mention this. So look at this uh, thick short lines here. Uh, these are called apomorphies. Now, uh, what are these? Uh, these are 
sort of uh, new evolutionary trait that is unique to a particular species and all its descendants. So uh, this therefore can be used in defining character for a species or a group in phylogenetic terms. For example, the flowers here only appeared uh, after the uh, uh, gymnosperms. Uh, and basically, they are a separate group from the angiosperms, who are called flowering plants. And the uh, cladistics also make good use of these apomorphies to check for patterns in the uh, evolutionary history. Now, of course, now uh, we can now define systematics. So it's a science, science that sounds like taxonomy. Okay, we know that taxonomy has something to do with identification, naming, and the grouping plants. Uh, but take note that systematics also, we have to level up. We have to go one step higher. So it's not only limited to taxonomy, uh, but rather it must also include phylogeny. Uh, phylogeny is the um, evolutionary history of life. Again, uh, plant systematics is an overlap between taxonomy and phylogeny. That's why it's, it can be a complicated field to some. Because we have to integrate here the prin principles of evolution. Okay, so let's have a short review of evolution, guys. We know that evolution is the gradual. So it's uh, it happens in a very slow manner. So this refers to the gradual change of uh, <clears throat> various life forms from the moment they first appeared in this planet or other parts of the universe, if you believe that life also can exist there. And uh, there was, uh, there was, and uh, there will always be uh, the sequence of changes, modifications, or, sh or shall we say mutations, as life continues to adapt to the environment and attempt to survive alongside the, your competition and availability of resources. Now, Charles Darwin um, introduced us uh, to what he referred to as descent with modification. Uh, for example, uh, you descended from your parents, right? So they transferred their genetic material to you, but then uh, you're already a modified version of the original parent. So come to think of it. So if all life forms that you can imagine are all built on the same um, DNA or for nucleotide uh, instructions, basically uh, through time, uh, we can have new combinations and perhaps alterations that can trigger the formation of a new organism or species. So there is that continuous uh, modification as life uh, moves on in the timeline. But guys, take note that uh, when we talk about evolution, we are not confined to a single organism. So evolution can only be quantified at the uh, population level. So uh, some random mutant out there in uh, your X-Men movies, that's not evolution. So there, there must be a population that must be involved. A population must change in a rather similar direction before you can say that evolution happened. And uh, obviously, it takes lots of years, uh, millions of years, probably. Now, in summary, uh, evolution is descent with modification. Uh, and it occurs because we have changes in the genetic makeup of populations over time. Now, how does evolution occur? Now, there are two mechanisms in theory on uh, how evolution can happen. So, we have uh, this random genetic drift. Uh, we have randomized modifications that led to permanent changes. And of course, we also have another process. It's very popular. We call that natural uh, selection, that natural selection thing or theory, which in principle is uh, non not random or non-random. Because again, the genetic change is directed or influenced by the environment. So you are being selected naturally. Uh, for example, you can have all the good traits that you can think of, okay? But if you are in the wrong environment, okay, you will um, barely thrive. Uh, Whereas this, uh, you die and all those genes you have are lost forever. So uh, there is this term called fitness. 
So it's a relationship between your potential in various environments. Uh, you can be very fit in maybe one or two environments and uh, unfit in the rest. Okay. Now it also comes with the concept of adaptation. So to survive, you must first adapt. And once adapted, you can proceed to become successful in the given environment. So once you're successful in your um, in that environment and your descendants are insured of, let's say, a secured life and um, away from the threat of extinction, then uh, perhaps your species has established itself among the rest. That's why speciation is the ultimate goal of evolution. So after a period of time, as you continue uh, the so-called descent with modification, it is likely that uh, another species can spring from your, uh, let's say, lineages. Uh, this can be very useful in the grouping of organisms. Okay, so that's enough for now for evolution. So let's now look at taxonomy as another component of plant systematics. So for taxonomy, you re remember the DINC, D-I-N-C. So this stands for description, identification, nomenclature, and classification. So it's totally self-explanatory. Now the goal of taxonomy is of course to group organisms into classification units called um, taxa or taxon. Uh, description has something to do with assigning features or attributes or shall we say generalized traits to a taxon. So that means you belong to the group because you possess similar characteristics. Now uh, these are technically called characters and uh, they can exist in various alternative versions called character traits. Okay. And uh, let me give a specific example. Uh, you can actually uh, use here the analogy of variables. Okay, For example, uh, in a pea plant, for example, the flower color is the character. And it can exist in two states or character states. You have the white and purple color. Now, in describing a taxon, um, we must be uh, accurate. And of course, we should consider the commonalities more than the differences. Because again, we will be grouping plants here based on their common features. Identification is uh, uh, obviously uh, recognizing that a plant belongs to a group and has the specific, uh, specific or common name uh, or of course the scientific name. Okay, let's take it like this. Suppose a teacher uh, gave you an unknown plant uh, specimen and you are asked to identify it. Now what will you do? Of course, uh, given the information resources nowadays, you can easily identify plants. But uh, conservatively, uh, botanists use what they call as taxonomic keys. I actually happened to use this key before during my MS biology years. We used a uh, dichotomous key uh, from a book called Flora of Manila. So it was a very old book. It's barely readable. So I, during the time, I actually retyped it and gave the key to my teacher and fortunately I still have it here I still have it here in my old file so it's here okay uh, I will probably create version 2 of this before you can ask for a copy so this is what I meant by being dichotomous so you have here two con contrasting statements now each statement is a lead and this pair of leads constitute a couplet now I guess uh, this is easy for you to figure out. So just use this to uh, identify. Uh, for example here, this is the key to the uh, families of plants found here in the Philippines. Alright. On the other hand, we have nomenclature. It's also part of taxonomy. Now this is the formal naming of a taxa according to some standardized system. Uh, for plants, algae, and fungi, according to Simpson here, the rules and regulations for the naming of taxa are provided by the International Code of Botanical Nomenclature. 
But always take note guys that the fundamental principle of uh, nomenclature is that all taxa may bear only one scientific name. Now it may be practical f- uh, to, s- to simple gardeners to just use uh, uh, common names. But of course if you want to communicate scientifically, you have to deal with these binomial names. Uh, that we know it's made up of the genus and the species epithet. Then we have classification, okay, we group plants, we have this hierarchical order of things, uh, we call these ranks, and the mnemonics goes this way, so kings play chess on fine grain sand, and we have kingdom, phylum, uh, class, uh, uh, class order, family, genus, and species. If you want to add a domain, okay, just add a D. So dumb kings play chess on uh, fine grain sand, right? Since uh, there is much to reconsider, especially with all conventions, uh, right now there is actually no single uh, unified way to classify plants. Basically, we have uh, two in practice. We have what we refer to as phonetic classification. As I have said a while ago, we classify based on the overall similarities. But I also pointed out some problems that can arise by just basing uh, only uh, only on, uh, let's say, external features. So uh, we uh, we we also have this more robust phylogenetic classification. Again, phylogenetic we now consider the evolutionary history. And I guess, or I believe, uh, molecular classification also falls here so we can really be uh, we can really be ensured of the reli- reliability of the groupings because again we have integrated the molecular systems and methods i hope that uh, this introduction has provided you a good insight on why you need to have this subject in your chosen field of study now if you haven't been attentive enough uh, maybe i can give you uh, the three important the reasons why you need to study plant systematics. Uh, of course, you have to first you have to organize the vast amount of information out there about the diversity of plants. So you really need the systematics there. Uh, two, most probably, uh, it can it also unifies all the subdisciplines in plant biology. Okay. So everything from plant anatomy and uh, physiology to microbiology. Uh, ecology and the rest of uh, plant biology so systematics will always be part of uh, part of this uh, subdisciplines or subjects and um, it is also the foundation of biodiversity so those uh, those that deal with uh, with uh, the number of species uh, or of plant species and uh, I think uh, these biodiversity studies are incredibly important in saving our planet by uh, our conservation and restoration biology. And uh, finally, of course, you have to think of the economic value of plants from food to energy and medicine. Uh, it really pays to be organized, uh, to be organized in uh, all economic uh, enterprise that involves plants and uh, human welfare. So, uh, bye for now, guys. I'll see you again soon. Thank you very much for watching.